Hello folks, Minmax Munchking back with an old school hour plus long video where I talk about all sorts of things pertaining to the character in question, the clock clock. There's no script, there's no nothing, I'm just talking out of my head and uh, yeah, as some of you and maybe even a lot of you will know, that usually takes a while, you know, because I just tend to talk forever and ever. Um, I want to make a slight detour, like a slight experiment where I address some of the comments on the main video. There's like 130 something comments and some of them raised... Uh, legitimate questions you know concerns i don't know maybe even some criticism and i think it's uh it's a fair play to address all of those right so um without any like order or anything i'm just kind of like gonna address all of these uh, individually so ricardo for example said that he would prefer web with the pushing invocation he's talking about the uh, repelling blast instead of agonizing blast Instead of the darkness plus devil sight, I don't agree because both, for example, fairy fire, which you do get, and web, which you can learn, but I don't think it's that good. Uh, they are very inconsistent. Uh, they, they, both of those spells, fairy fire and web, rely on saving throws, and if the enemy succeeds on the saving throw, that enemy is not affected by these spells. Therefore, all of your Critical mechanics for increasing the damage and all of that for giving yourself advantage. They don't really work, you know so uh, I Don't also think that the downside of darkness is that bad um, Because for let me let me kind of like quickly demonstrate that so for example, let's say this is a fight, right? Uh, let's say this is the something something and you're fighting this Um Let's say that this is the character, this is the clock clock, right? And um, let's say that the fight began somehow like this, right? Like all, all of the frontliners were in, were in the front, you were somehow in, somewhat in the back, uh, whatever. And then the, the initiative started, all of that, whatever, right? Um, what you do is basically you turn on your darkness right which is something like this i'm not gonna go into whether the darkness is fully circle or a square because of the in fifth edition there's like uh if you go diagonally uh now i'm gonna waste time talking about this but if you go diagonally in fifth edition it's like the same distance as if you go straight that's how fifth edition works 15 feet if you go diagonally, 15 feet if you go straight. Now, we all know that, that this is not how actual, like, e Euclidean, whatever, ge geometry works, but that's how 5th edition works. It, simplify th it simplifies things and all of that. So, if we say that 15 feet straight is still in the darkness, but 15 feet diagonally is not, even though it's 15 feet here and 15 feet there, that doesn't really make much sense, right? You would need 15 feet of movement to move there as the same as you would need 15 feet of movement to move there. So that's why when I play D&D, when I DM, I usually use squares. Even though if the spell says circle, I use a square because of the diagonal distance being the same as a straight, a straight line distance. But anyway, that's neither here or there. This is basically what would happen if you activate your darkness, right? So you activate your darkness, you shoot your Eldritch Blasts at the enemy, and then you're thinking, wow, all of my allies are in the darkness. Well, that's kind of bad, right? Yeah, it is. They cannot see, but first and foremost, they can move in melee, right? So all of your melee characters are immediately outside of the line of, uh, outside of the darkness. But if you don't want to debuff your What's, what's there, uh, your uh, range characters or your support party members, all you do is just 1, 2, 3, and 4, that's basically 20 feet of movement, right? Am I wrong? 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah, so 20 feet of movement to move out of the, completely move away so that all of your party members are not affected by darkness. And then, in, 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 the, in the round number 2, all you do is just, let's say that you... I mean, you cooperate with your party mates and then you tell them, can you please please move there and there? 
And then all you do is just move 15 feet in this direction. Shoot your Eldritch Blasts. Pew, 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 pew. And then move away, right? So that everybody... So that nobody is affected by darkness. So even in these, like, small, tight, confined spaces, uh, dungeons, labyrinths, and all of that, the darkness, it doesn't have to necessarily be um, a debuff. Now, sure, it could happen, but uh, this is... Okay, so this is like a, a worst case scenario or somewhere close to that where you are really fighting in confined, op closed, like tight spaces. But if you're fighting somewhere in the open, let's say something like this, right? Where the enemy is just out there in the open and let's say you are the Sorlock. You just move into the corner, you activate your darkness. Um, and then you bother nobody, right? If you're, it doesn't really matter if you're there. Your Eldritch Blast has 120 feet of distance anyway. So everybody else, you just move in the corner, right? Like you move there, and uh, everybody else is here, and that's pretty much that, right? I mean, and then let's say if you get knocked to, to zero hit points, your darkness goes away because it's a concentration. So somebody can still cast healing word. Or cure wounds on you. So it's like, in my own opinion, darkness is not nearly as much of an issue for ranged characters as it is for melee characters, right? So that's that for that comment. Uh, by the way, I'm not really, I'm not really trying to call out any of you people who comment on my videos. I'm just like Ricardo and all the other people that I'm gonna be reading comments from. Uh, you are raising legitimate questions, such as. D&D Talks, Kyle and um, Kazoo, they, uh, all three of them raised the legitimate concern about when I was um, talking about Time Stop. Um, so, let's call it like that, right? Time Stop, right? So, if you, if you cast Time Stop, the moment you cast, um, the moment you cast Hex or use Hexblade's Curse on the enemy, uh, the spell ends. Right, so, um, you, you, if you cast Time Stop and then you start using Hexblitz Curses and all of that, the spell will end. So, I made a critical error in the video, where I said that you're casting, that you're casting your Time Stop with an action, right? Now, this is wrong, right? I mean, I made an error and these people pointed out that error. It's just like, this doesn't do good. So, what you need to do and what I meant to say in the video but it was kind of late it was 3 a.m in the morning and um, I was like already tired so I made a mistake right instead of casting time stop with your action which is the usual casting time of the time stop you use your bonus action and then you just use your quickened spell meta magic right this will uh, require two sorcery points but after you do this, like you cast time stop with the bonus action, you still have your action to do. You you have your regular action to do whatever you do, right? So let me try to do this. Uh, yeah, there we go. So I made an error here. Let me actually, yeah. So instead of an action, you cast time stop with the bonus action. You still have. Let's say you have the worst case scenario where you roll. Um, you roll a d1, you roll a 1 on a d4, so you only get you only get two turns, that's what I assumed in this video. So you still get your two bonus actions and, and your two, two actions as part of the time stop spell, right? But you would first cast Blink and Trance of Order, and then instead of Eldritch Blast, you would cast, I don't know, like Fire Shield or Greater Invisibility... Or something like that, right? I mean, it, it, whatever buff... There's a lot of buffs that buffs that we are going to be talking about in this video. But let's say that you cast Blink in your first turn, uh, paired with Trance of Order. And then on your second turn, you first cast a Fire Shield, because it still only affects you. And then you activate your Hex Blitz Curse. And then after you activate your, your Hex Blitz Curse, Time Stop immediately ends... But you still have your action, right? The, the, the same way that we 
described it in here because all of all of this that we just talked about all of these two bonus actions and two actions they happened during your regular bonus action during which you cast your time stop and then your time stop gave you two turns in a row you can move and use your actions as normal you get your two bonus actions and two actions and you use your hexblade's curse last so that you can activate all of your buffs and all of your other stuff first uh, also, you can cast spells using your bonus. You can still quicken. You can still use your quickened meta magic with your other spells. I don't really see the reason why to do that, but I mean, you can if you want. Whatever, right? I mean, you can cast delayed blast fireball if that's the better option. I mean, I'm just kind of like throwing out things that you can do here. But I'm gonna talk about it more later right um so that's one of the mistakes that i made right so you still cast your eldritch blast with your action uh and your bonus action becomes a time stop right uh so that's that obviously simulacrum has its bonus action and its action now the reason i didn't um the reason i didn't do time stop with your sim with the simulacrum is because you used your ninth level slot Ninth level spell slot to cast wish and through wish you can cast any other spell and obviously one of the spells that you can cast is simulacrum but once you cast wish and may you make a simulacrum of yourself you already are out of your ninth level slot so your simulacrum will have all of your spell slots except your ninth level slot so therefore your simulacrum cannot do the time stop shenanigans but your simulacrum can still do trance of order and bonus action and, uh, you know, uh, Eldritch Blast and all, all, all of that other stuff. I'm gonna talk about the optimal damage uh, distribution over rounds later on, if I, if I remember. Uh, this, what I talked about, is not the optimal way to do damage. This is, like, when you want to activate all of your damage buffs, sure, but... There is something as wasting too many rounds to activate too many of your buffs. For example, here, Trance of Order and Spirit Shroud is enough, right? I mean, this is pretty much enough. You don't need Hexblade's Curse. The damage increase from Hexblade's Curse in the round number 3 is not nearly enough as it would be if you just quicken Eldritch Blast. And then you do your Spirit Shroud damage. And your Eldritch Blast damage. You would do way more damage while... You would do like 200, 200 something or close to 200 damage in the round number 3 if you don't activate Hexblade's Curse. Instead you just go, you know, you, you cast Eldritch Blast two times as you would do in round number 4. But I was kind of like trying to demonstrate with these mathematical whatever, what I, what I, what I was doing. Like what would be the maximum amount of damage that you could do in in like round number four if you activate all of your buffs right so this is kind of like what you can do but that's neither here or there um thank you to all the people who commented and uh, to, uh, let me know that i made an error uh, so kyle dnd talks and uh, kazu komatsu thank you for pointing that out um so uh yeah, so uh, another person pointed out that at 3.33, that's, <laughs> that's, that's funny. Um, I said that I am swapping protection from evil and good with Glyph of Warding. Now, this is not possible. Uh, if we go to class features and show more, uh, you can replace one spell you gain from this feature with another spell of the same level. So... For example, I cannot swap protection from evil and good with uh, Glyph of Warding because Glyph of Warding is a third level spell. So I can only swap it with either Dispel Magic or Protection from Energy. But since I already picked Blink uh, as my spell to take from Protection from Energy, what you can do is um, instead of Protection from evil and good, which you you would get rid of this spell anyway if you take a Glyph of Warding. You can take, for example, uh, Feather Fall as your uh, as your replacement for, for, for protection from, from evil and good. And then your Dispel Magic you can swap for Glyph of Warding and your protection from energy you can swap from Blink. 
and then with your ordinary uh, ordinary sorcerer spell you can learn dispel magic just the ordinary sorcerer learning one spell every time uh, he or she levels up right so there's still ways to do this it's just different than what i described and i will also i i, I kind of forgot to uh, edit that in the file i will probably do it later somewhere in here i need to like beautify it ma make it correct so yeah thank you uh what's your name logan reed that's another little error that i made uh, it's still possible to have all of these spells that I talked about in the video, as I've said, but you need to approach it slightly differently. Um, you know, the distribu distribution of spells between your Clockwork Magic feature and just your ordi ordinary spellcasting feature, which allows you to learn spells as you level up, needs to be slightly different. Uh, the result is the same, right? Um, what's this? So, uh, this was a comment... Oh yeah, so this is like one of those situations where I would make an exception. So this person has been invited to a campaign where the party is level 15. Um, and Tyler asked a legitimate question. How would I level this level the class in this case? Should I take 13 Sorcerer to Warlock or 14 Sorcerer and 1 Warlock? In my own opinion, I would take 14 Sorcerer and 1 Warlock. Yes, this does mean that you do not get Agonizing Blast and Devil Society Invocations. You simply don't get those. Uh, however, I think that Trance of Order trumps uh, those, uh, those invocations. And you would get these invocations anyway after you level up. Uh, but on your level 15, which may last for like 2 sessions, 4 sessions... I mean, I don't know, you could play at level 15 for like 10 sessions, right? I don't know. Um, I would make an exception and I would only take one level of Warlock for that Trance of Order feature, which, as we all know, is absolutely nuts. It allows you to roll a minimum of 10 on all of your or on all of your attack rolls and, you know, Eldritch Blasts, you get a lot of them. So all of your Eldritch Blasts become pretty, pretty juicy, right? Um... Again, you could manage without Trance of Order. You could just use your Darkness and Devil's Sight um, uh, combo of invocations, or maybe even Greater Invisibility uh, plus Elven Accuracy. You would get your 3d20 Super Advantage Elven Accuracy, but personally I think you should start with Trance of Order. Uh, I don't think the damage, uh, the, the damage reduction from not having Agonizing Blast is gonna impact you that much as... So, le let me put it this way. If you are hitting all of your attack rolls, the damage reduction from not having Agonizing Blast is gonna be compensated by the fact that all of your attack rolls are gonna be hitting. Now, of course, if you're fighting an enemy who has like 21 or, or higher AC... Or even 20, yeah, 20 AC or higher at level uh, 15. Sure, you are still rolling ordinary attack rolls. You still need to roll 11 or 12 on the D20. So even your Trance of Order is not going to work. But for the most part, even at level 15, 16, you are going to be fighting enemies that are in between 17 to 20 AC, right? So you're still going to be hitting all of your shots or at least most of them right um so that's my opinion on that um yeah thank you tyler for asking the question i mean uh, content is content right um what's this i kind of forgot what this was uh so yeah what level do you recommend uh, getting the first multi-class level into warlock i mean if you're playing this character from le from level one and then you're thinking what to do uh, at later levels. I would say right away at level 2, you get your first level of Warlock. Sorry, I need to blow my nose. <coughs> I'm sure that sounded lovely, lovely on your own ends. Uh, I probably bled all of your ears. I apologize for that, but my nose was just completely... Yeah, it was completely shot. Uh, level 2 is when I would recommend it, uh, as I did in my progression. Level 2. Level 2. You don't really need a second level. You could manage without a second level, but I think, in my own opinion, 
Uh, those early levels really benefit super well uh, from Agonizing Blast. And later on, even from Devil's Side. I mean, you only need, what, like, level 5 of character to get Darkness? Uh, both from your uh, race uh, and your class. So you get your uh, Draw Magic Darkness at level 5 thing uh, at level 5, right? And then at level 5 you get your Sorcerer level 3, which also gives you Darkness. So... Yeah, at level 5, you're kind of like almost fully complete. Basically, level 6 is when you get your Elven Accuracy feat. And then you can say that you're like at the point where... Once you cast your Darkness, which you're probably going to be casting with Quickened Metamagic, so that you still have your action to cast Eldritch Blast, you're rolling 3d20 to hit in most combat encounters, because at these early levels... Like 6, 7, 8, even 10. Not a lot of monsters have true sight, blind sight, tremor sense and things like that. So your darkness plus elven accuracy combo is going to be uh, netting you so many easy hits. Even against enemies with high armor classes. That it becomes slightly, you know, like you kind of deal more damage than most other characters on the board. Even though that... Your hits don't necessarily deal, your individual hits don't deal that much damage, but you so rarely miss with, with, with this. It's just, you know, I played the level 7 car uh, level seven Sorlock recently, and uh, I used the Darkness plus Elven Accuracy feat. Uh, it wasn't a Clockwork Sorcerer, it was a Divine Sorcerer, um, but we needed some healing and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was just... It was nuts. I mean, I, I don't remember ever missing a single attack roll while my darkness was up. Now, later on, I lost my darkness due to fight being overly deadly. We almost all died. Uh, it was super hard. Um, but yeah, we managed to win. I got knocked to zero hit points, but I dealt so much damage. It, it wasn't even... Yeah, it was just... It, it was obnoxious. Uh, so yeah, that's that for this comment. Let me see what other thing was in there. Oh yeah, so some person, Kev, Q, whatever, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, yeah, I usually do pick like a, a, a pre-made background. Because, as I've said in the comments, some DMs don't allow these. And also picking a background instead of customizing one every time is kind of easier. It's already made. And people can just pick it off of the list of options. Instead of me trying to describe, oh yeah, well, you, there's a, this rule on page, whatever, whatever, you can customize your... So instead of taking the default option, I advise you to do this, this and that. Yeah, you know what I mean. And also some DMs don't allow these. I don't know why that's the case. I At my tables, we usually allow customizations of these backgrounds. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this allows for, for most... For maximum table compatibility and DM compatibility, if that's even a thing, I don't know, whatever. Um, obviously, pick perception, I mean, that's the most important skill. Um, other than that, I mean, whatever, do whatever you want, right? Uh, it's your character, it's not mine, I'm just, I'm merely making suggestions here. Uh, Spirit Shroud, which I talked about briefly in this video, has some limitations. That is correct, uh, let me... Uh, don't watch porn, please. Uh, there's some porn in here, yeah. Anyway, um... Yeah, it does. I mean, I agree. So, if... In, 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 in the alternative split of this class... Uh, I talked about where you can take, like, uh, 5 levels of Warlock and 15 in Sorcerer... Instead of just 2 and 18. Uh, the reason to do that is the Spirit Shroud spell... Which massively increases your Eldritch Blast damage... Um, it is a concentration, so you cannot, you cannot, uh, combine it with darkness, you cannot combine it with hex, sure, I mean, that's true. However, I mean, uh, at those high levels, uh, you have a lot of high level spell slots. I mean, you have all of the spell slots that you can possibly need, and sometimes you kind of don't even need them. So what my logic was is like spirit shroud is just like level 7 spell slot combined with the time stop which is a level 9 spell slot you activate all of those buffs and now you have trance of order you have spirit shroud 
and uh, basically that's all you need, right? You, you roll 21 to hit, 20, 21, that's your minimum. And on all of your hits, you roll like 3d8, right? Am I wrong? So 1d8 is at level 3, 5 is... Yeah, so so 3d8, 3 times 4.5, plus uh, 5.5, a median from the d10, uh, plus your agonizing blast, plus let's say you even activated your Hexblade's curse, right? So let's say that's 6. Um, that is 30 damage per hit... We are ignoring uh, uh, critical hit chances. If if you critically hit, that's <laughs> that's basically plus thirteen point five more. So your critical hits are just insane. So thirty is your basic damage. You have eight rays. That's two hundred and forty damage, right? I mean, that's with with just um, with your character, right? That's just what you do, right? I mean, if you have simulacrum, right? If you activate your simulacrum, which has, which can also activate spirit shroud, let's say number, this easily becomes times two, right? I mean, because your simulacrum can do level seven spirit shroud as well. So, okay, well, truth be told, you cannot do. Okay, so my bad, you cannot do simulacrum because you don't have wish. You also don't have time stop. What am I talking about? Yeah. So <laughs> now I'm just talking out of my ass. Um, yeah, so obviously you cannot do any of none of that because you don't have level nine slots. Still, level seven spirit shroud, two hundred and forty damage. That's that's a lot. That's that's quite quite a lot. I mean, you would be you would be foolish not to activate this if if you decide to do that. I mean, if you compare the uh, the the level the level eighteen uh, the eighteen two split to fifteen and five yeah I mean the level the eighteen two split deals more damage, but the fifteen five split has more damage right away. So once you activate your spirit shroud, your damage becomes absolutely insane. I mean it it's the 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 twelve d eight uh, which which is basically what happens uh, with your eldritch blast that that bonus gets doubled with your quickened eldritch blast two hundred damage right away in round in round number three assuming we don't even activate hexblade's curse um, yeah that's that, that I mean look whatever you choose to do. Um, it's gonna be good this um, whenever your character deals more than 100 what 100 points of damage per round is like you can consider yourself an absolute shredder so anything above 100 damage trust me like because uh, fifth edition is not really made for characters that on that are this consistent with the damage right I mean let's say 50 to 80 damage per round is like where most level 20 characters are uh, end up at the damage per round, but these kinds of characters easily go way, way beyond 100 damage. So, um, I mean, uh, let's say up to 100 damage is where most of your normal, let's call them normal, 5th uh, edition characters end up at. So once you go above that, uh, you are in the territory of being, I'm not gonna say overpowered, but you're, you're definitely in the territory of being... Uh, very very tuned for like above average damage um so yeah that's that for this comment um what's left there's a couple comments left yes yeah, so let's see um you don't pretty pretty simple you can either darkness greater invis or hex if you hex your damage is gonna be higher but your accuracy is gonna be way 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 lower there's reasons to have both of these spells because you, especially on lower levels, where you don't really have a lot of spell slots. I mean, on lower levels where you only have like one or two spell slots of level two. Let's say level five, uh, character level five, right? Um, character level six, let's say. Uh, it's only a sorcerer level four. So you have like what level uh, two level? Uh, you have two, two or three level two slots. Three level. I, th I think you have three level two spell slots. And then you have one casting of darkness from your uh, race, right? So your draw magic. So you can only cast darkness, what, like two or three times per day. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you you can you, you can run out of it pretty, pretty quickly, especially if you go through some 
super slow, I don't know, uh, dungeon crawly scenario where you need to manage your resources very, very well. For example, something like this, right, what I talked about previously at the beginning of the video. Uh, a scenario like this would be where you cast Hex uh, on your first enemies and then you maintain that Hex for like these kinds of enemies. Maybe even these enemies, maybe even those enemies, and then later on, if you once you get to a boss, you would cast, for example, something like uh, Darkness, and then obviously Elven Accuracy feat and all of that. So now that you can, you know, you can do uh, do this like super accuracy, Elven Accuracy, super advantage, whatever you want to call it. Uh, by the way, yeah, this was uh, what you're looking at. This was an actual session that I DM'd. I don't even remember last year sometime. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, th this actually happened. This is not just something that I put for this video. I'm just reusing it because I'm lazy. I mean, and it's kind of perfect for what I want to talk about. But anyway, uh, that's it for this comment. Uh, what's this? Uh, oh yeah, this is the pin of shame as the commenter himself or herself said. Um... Obviously, you can read. I, I'm kind of like mocking a little bit, but I mean... So, it's kind of a valid point. Uh, it's just that uh, the tone of delivery is not, uh, not the nicest, should I say. But um, yeah, I mean, your party is gonna hate you because you do all the damage. Honestly, if you're playing in a party that hates characters that do a lot of damage, you're probably not playing with the right people if you catch my point i'm not so this may this might sound sound wrong uh some people just hate combat they want to play characters that deal 10 damage per round and you know they hate dms who, dr who drop deadly encounters on them because they always want to win i'm not necessarily hate uh hating that i'm not necessarily say saying that's wrong but for me personally if i'm gonna play a campaign where there's never gonna be a single combat encounter where I even remotely feel threatened and fearing for the life of my character. I'm oh, I'm probably not having as much fun as I would like to have. So for that reason, most of my DMs, all of my DMs, sometimes even often drop very, very deadly encounters. And I make characters that are capable of dealing with such encounters... Therefore, I make characters that can deal a lot of damage, that can uh, debuff an enemy a lot, that can support like madmen or mad women, um, whatever, right? So, that's the kinds of characters that I make and, and like to play. Um, the DM hating you for dealing massive damage, honestly, I think that's the DM's problem. And uh, that's not necessarily your problem. I mean, this class has been made official. You can love or hate uh, the Wizards of the Coast, but once you get to level 14, level 15, level 16, those are very, very high character levels. And if your DM is not ready to deal with such levels, that's the DM's problem. Uh, that's not your problem, because every DM who gets that high um, needs to be aware that characters of those levels have super high uh, level, uh, magic, super high spells... Features like these, uh, game-breaking mechanics, uh, stuff that makes them nigh invincible, nigh unkillable. Uh, you need to drop like five times deadly encounters on such characters to even challenge them at times. Yeah, so I don't necessarily even agree with this. Uh, I've already covered this. Um, this, is, I, this is a moot point. I don't agree with this completely. As I've said in my own reply, there's not in, in, enough time in these short 10-minute videos, 8-minute videos, 9-minute videos to talk about all of the spells and stuff like that. Those kinds of uh, discussions are reserved for these videos where I'm already speaking for 35 minutes and I haven't e even begun talking about the mechanics of the character. So yeah, that's gonna be fun. This is gonna be a 2-hour long video probably. I don't know. Um... So yeah, that's that for that. Uh, honestly, Cyanide, uh, I'm not mad at you, I'm just making fun. Um, you raised a couple of good points. I mean, people need to be aware that not every table, not every group of players, not every DM is ready to deal 
with these kinds of characters. These kinds of characters that I make uh, videos about and talk about on this channel uh, are not meant for every kind of D&D that's being played out there. Let's say it like that. I mean, I'm not saying this is bad. I'm not saying this is better. I'm not saying this is whatever. I'm just saying it's not everyone's cup of tea, right? So, yeah, uh, I kind of agree with what you said. Now, uh, I'm a nitpicker. I don't agree that darkness is a problem, as I've already explained at the beginning of this video, as I've uh, demonstrated it, right? You just kind of, like, move in, shooty shooty, eldritch blasty, you move away so that nobody's in your darkness, right? So you can do this in almost every combat encounter that I can possibly think of, other than maybe... Okay, so let's say that... <laughs> Let's say that you're fighting in here, right? Even if you're fighting in here, you can move in this corner over here. And yes, sure, there's a darkness over there, but your your party still has all of this space outside of the darkness to fight, right? So, in most cases, in most combat encounters that I've played in, that I've watched other people play characters that use darkness plus devil sight combo in, darkness on ranged characters is not a problem. Uh, so that's that for that, and uh, do we have a couple other, I think, comments? Yeah. Uh, um, this was... Uh, yeah, so through that, I agree. So I already touched briefly upon it, where um, this is not really the best way to, 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 to deal damage with this character. Uh, this uh, kind of like... <laughs> Demonstra demonstration of what you can do with this character. This is not the most optimal approach. For example, the most optimal approach here uh, with this character would be round number one, Trance of Order, round number two, Spirit Shroud, round number three, Quickened Eldritch Blast. You don't need Hexblade's Curse. Hexblade's Curse only adds 24 damage, therefore 48 damage on top of the damage that you already do. So you would be doing something like 90, 96 damage per Eldritch Blast, so that's almost 200 damage if you use Quickened Eldritch Blast instead of your Hexblade's Curse. So, 190 something damage is way more than 120 damage, so yes, you're correct. This is not the most optimal approach to dealing damage. Uh, also here, um, you don't need to activate Hex, for example, here. Uh, you can immediately start uh, quickening your Eldritch Blast. I mean, you Hexblade's Curse is enough. Hex is only adding, what, like 46? That's, I don't even know how much is that. Um, 4 times 3.5. 14 damage, so times 2, yeah, it's like 28 damage. That's not nearly as much to, to, to do. Uh, it's it's better to quicken the Eldritch Blast instead of activating your Hex. But I was kind of like trying to demonstrate how many rounds you need to activate all of your buffs and how many rounds you need to achieve theoretic, theoretical maximum average damage that you can possibly achieve with this character. Obviously, waiting three or four rounds to deal your maximum damage is probably not the best approach. It's better to deal more damage now than maximum damage later. You need to kill your enemies as fast as possible, right? That's usually the best case, the, the, the best thing to do. Um, so, yeah, I agree with your comment completely. Uh, don't get me wrong on that. So, where... I'm kind of lost, sorry. Uh, already addressed that. Already addressed this. There's, like, one more comment, right? Yeah. Um, let's see. You should do 10... To to this is not... This is not... Uh, relevant for this particular topic but um this is kind of like my issue when somebody says something like 10 strongest builds what does it even mean right i mean what is strong what is powerful powerful is a support character that can heal you for 10 points of damage every round is very very powerful it's super powerful and i already made that character recently it's called candle keeper but how do you compare that power with the power of this character who can completely shred any enemy with an AC of 21 or below. Just completely shred it. It's just completely deleted in one or two rounds of combat. How do you compare those powers? Like, I, I, Honestly, I cannot... 
I don't think I'm capable of equating those. It's different types of power, right? Which is, then I went on a completely, you know, like I just asked a bunch of rhetorical questions. And then the commenter himself or herself, I don't even know, Leon Dream? It's, it's a he, she, I don't know. Um, now even, I don't know what I want. Yeah, I mean, how do you... It's, it's just like, what does it even mean? Right? What does the strongest build mean? What's the most powerful d and I don't even know, dude. I make powerful d and builds, characters, and even I don't know how would you... How would you, like, rank them? Because power is different, right? Like, support power is very, very different than this, like, single target damage power. Um... AoE damage, like Blasting Power, something like Storm Priest, the, the character that deals damage to multiple enemies. That's that's dealing damage, but that's a different type of damage compared to, to Clock Clock, right? So, I don't know. Short answer is, I don't know how to do that. Uh, and until I figure that out, you're probably never gonna see these kinds of videos from me. Or maybe, maybe you see all of these videos one day. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, that's it for the comments. Now, let's waste another hour of my and your uh, precious time talking about all the nitty-gritty details of, you know, mechanics and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, let's kind of like briefly go over the character. I already talked about most of the important stuff in the, in the short video. And uh, yeah, if you don't want to watch another hour of me talking forever and ever... Go watch that 8 minute, 9 minute video. But for all of you who do have time and who find these um, long ass videos entertaining, useful or whatever else reason you have to watch them. Yeah, stick around, grab some popcorn, grab some water, I don't know, some juice, whatever you want, whatever you consume. And uh, yeah, let's, let's go. So basically... Uh, race right i mean race racial choice there's really not many options here there's really half elf uh even with tasha even with tasha's um optional ca character customization features which allow you to to swap your ability score Im uh, inc improvements and languages and whatnot even make your own custom race nothing really beats the draw half elf uh, race because you get your plus two to charisma plus one to deck plus two pl uh, two floating points which you can assign to any ability score that you want in this case dex and con make the most make the most sense and then charisma obviously you need charisma for both warlock and uh, and sorcerer uh, the, the reason to take the draw is for the draw magic is because you get both fairy fire which gives you advantage but also you get Darkness, which gives you guaranteed advantage, provided that you take Devil's Sight Eldritch Invocation, which you you will take it. Um, there's no reason not to, right? <laughs> Languages, as usual, I usually go for Goblin, Giant, Orcish, Dwarvish, those kinds of languages that have the highest odds of being used. And then I try, then I usually kind of like tie those languages to the background story to the backstory of the character. Obviously, if you're playing this character in the elemental plane, uh, el elemental plane of water or something like that, I don't know, like pick, pick freaking pri primordial, right? I mean, that that makes more sense than than orcish or anything else, right? So, your language selection will depend on the type of campaign and the, the world that you're playing in, whatever, right? So that's that's up to you for to, 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 to choose. Uh, point by, I think, so there is a third way to do this, right? So instead of having your dexterity up to 16, you can also do this, which I don't know why I didn't put it before, but I'm going to put it now. You don't really need six. You 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 can do you can deal just fine with fourteen. Why? Because you're gonna be wearing medium armor anyway. You're gonna be taking your hexblade warlock, which gives you medium armor proficiency. And as you all know, 
or if you don't know now you will know is that when you wear medium armor when you don't medium armor the maximum benefit from dexterity that you can gain is a plus two you cannot gain a plus three if you want to gain a plus three you need to take medium armor master obviously we are not going to be taking that feat so you can kind of manage with this as well and then uh, you, you you put you know 14 in wisdom and then you put 15 in in, in constitution right so you can do this too um yeah so medium armor limits your dex bonus to plus two so this spread below makes sense as well. there we go so there's three options for you i would still personally um i would I, I would pick in between this and and that one um i would probably not go for this so i'm gonna put it last um so that it makes sense and then obviously i mean whatever you choose it's gonna be good uh higher dexterity does help a little bit in the low on the lower levels because a lot of saving throws are dexterity based so that plus one I mean, it may or may not help, but it definitely helps, for example, at level 1, where you take your sorcerer and then you don't even have your armor mastery, so you're not proficient with, with any armor, so you need to take your mage armor, right? So then, obviously, all of the, all of the other stuff... Ah, did, did I? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, yeah, ob ob oh, I didn't, but anyway, uh, you... You don't need to, but obviously, um, oh yeah, I did, mage armor. So, mage armor, there's no limit, 13 plus your dex, your AC is gonna be... So, for example, in this case, I need to scroll all, all the way up. In this case, it's gonna be 16, in this case, it's gonna be 15. It's not really that much of a difference, but it could mean, right? I mean, at low levels, every point of armor class matters, especially on a D6 class, like the sorcerer. So, it's like... Whatever you choose, it's not gonna be super bad. Maybe this is the most optimal approach for later levels. Because you have just the right amount of bonuses and, and ability score points in, 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 in these abilities that you really need. But um, neither, neither of these three are really like... You're not gonna fail with them. It's just, it, it just what means more to you. If you're playing on lower levels... This is completely justified, because you need as much hit points and as much armor class as needed. If you're playing on higher levels, something like this, one of these two makes 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 more sense, right? So that's it for the armor class. Already kind of covered the, uh, the, the background, not gonna talk too much about it. Uh, whatever gives you perception is good in my book, so obviously if your DM allows you to customize backgrounds, you can choose whatever you want, because this, this is not really a thematic build, this is more like a mechanic build, where your background choice and your backstory can be pretty much anything, right? Feats, let's talk about feats, uh, that's the most important, uh, one of the most important parts of these, uh, of this, uh, of this, of this character. So, Alvin Accuracy, I would immediately pick it. At level 4 of your Sorcerer, that would be level 6 of your character, in most cases. Uh, is when I would pick Alvin Accuracy, I would, uh, obviously, uh, even out my, uh, Charisma score, which uh, you begin with 17, right? But then you, 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 you even it out to, whatever, or to 18. And uh, after that, at level 8, uh, you would pick, obviously, Vorecaster, because Vorecaster still... You're still primarily a spellcaster, even though this character is better at Eldritch brrr lasting than any other character. Um, you still occasionally will want to cast your Wall of Force, which you're given uh, from your Clockwork Magic. You're still gonna eventually cast Banishment. You know, concentration spells that make more sense than just going for that Eldritch brrr, you know, which you can always do, but sometimes it's not the, the best thing to do, right? So, uh, I would still take Warcaster. Now, at level 12, 
Uh, this is not a mandatory feat, but I would take it because you're a sorcerer and uh, having all of these meta magic options is obviously good. Uh, the more the better. Uh, I'm careful. Once you get to these high levels, you will have you will have a couple of spells that would benefit from careful spell meta magic. Primarily, for example, synaptic static, which I'm going to talk about later. Uh, extended spell makes sense. You can even take, uh, for example, extended spell makes sense for the clockwork magic. For example, aid. You can extend the duration of aid to be 16 hours instead of just 8 hours, which is amazing, right? Um, anything else that has duration can be obviously extended for various reasons and circumstances that you find yourself in. Uh, obviously, all of your other meta magics will uh, will do just fine on their own. Quick and then twin right away at level three. Subtle, obviously, at level ten because you will want to. You will want to have this because you will want to be imperceptible in terms of your spell casting. And obviously, even if you're casting counter spell, for example, you don't want your own counter spell to be counter spelled. So the way you do that is with a subtle spell which is very cheap at level 10 and then later on heightened spell uh it is it is uh costly but at level 17 level 18 you have a lot of sorcery points anyway and then especially if you take the meta magic adept which gives you two additional sorcery points uh you can really have a lot of options careful extended uh subtle heightened twinned and quickened all of these meta magics are good for uh, whatever you need them, but yeah, more on that later. Um, again, not mandatory, but I would, I would take it. I would take it with this character. You really don't. Um, at level twelve, it's not really much of a difference of having like eighteen or twenty charisma, but having these two options at your disposal may, may mean a lot, may may make quite a bit of a difference uh, instead of not having them, right? It's better to have them and not need them than need them and not have them. That's my, that's my mantra. Um, obviously, uh, the, 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 the main class, the Clockwork Sorcerer, uh, let's kind of like briefly go over each and every one of the features that we already haven't covered. So, additional Sorcerer spells, this is a Tasha feature. Uh, I, I, by default, I enable all of these. Um, recently I made a poll on my YouTube channel and like 70-80% of you said that your DMs allow Tasha fully. So I'm just, I mean, I'm gonna cater to 80% of the people watching my videos. If your DM doesn't allow these, for this particular character, it's not really gonna matter too much. But, uh, you do get quite a bit of, uh, extra spells that sorcerers previously didn't have, right? Demiplane, for example... Uh, big Beast Hand is Big Fire Shield. All of these are, I mean, even Intellect Fortress, right? I mean, not necessarily, I didn't take it. But, for example, I took Tasha's Mind Whip. There's, uh, there's quite a bit of, uh, spells that, uh, yeah, you can, uh, you, you can, you can do. Uh, these ones with, uh, with, with stars, I think these are just changes. Uh, they've been changed, obviously, reworded or something like that, um. But I don't know, like, I don't. I think Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade was a sorcerer spell to begin with. Anyway, you get all of these extra spells in your list, you can pick them, you, you, you don't have to, whatever. Hit points, 1d6, pretty standard. Proficiencies, Con and Charisma. Con is pretty good, it's one of the reasons to, to start in Sorcerer, because you will be concentrating on uh, spells. Darkness, Greater Invisibility, Wall of Force, Banishment... Uh, you name it, there's there's spells for you to concentrate on, and Constitution uh, Saving Throw Proficiency will help concentrating on those spells. You will be failing those Concentration Saving Throws less and less, right? Uh, also, needless to say, it synergizes, synergizes with Warcaster Feet uh, as well. So, skills, I think Intimidation and Persuasion make the, mo make the most sense. For me personally... I don't think, um, I don't necessarily think that Clockwork Sorcerer, Clockwork Soul lends itself good for deception, because you borrow your power from the domains of uh, order, law, 
you know, and then deception really doesn't do well with order and law, if you catch my drift. Uh, I know that I didn't... My way of describing things is not the best, but, but English is my second language, so just bear with me. Therefore, I would, I would pick intimidation and persuasion for this character, because obviously if you're a law enforcer, if you have that kind of like cosmic force of law and order uh, coursing through your veins, intimidation makes more sense. Persuasion, I mean, sometimes you do want to have a little bit of a softer touch. You don't want to just intimidate everybody. Um, so yeah, having that like sweet, sweet touch and like way, way with the words uh, makes sense as well. Uh, spellcasting, standard sorcerer spellcasting, not really too much. Nothing too... too if you can hear this, that's my, um, that's my, um, what's, what's their name? Neighbors drilling something for like two months in a row. So I apologize. I'm not going to be stopping this video. I'm just going to be recording like this and you're going to be forced to listen to this until the very end. Uh, as much as it's going to irritate you, don't worry. It irritates me as well. Um, Sorcerer's Origin already talked about it. Clockwork Magic. Yeah, let me, let me talk about, uh. Let me talk a bit about clockwork magic, while my uh, my neighbors are completely uh, pissing me off. Uh, so, first and foremost, uh, I kind of touched upon this. Uh, let me find this. Yeah, so, um, the big thing about this feature is that you can swap all of these spells of accompanying levels, of the same level, that the spell that you're swapping uh, it with, uh, Ab abjuration and transmutation spells from sorcerer warlock and wizard list i'm not gonna go i'm not gonna be opening those lists and uh, talking about my choices but for example i'd immediately swap alarm for absorb elements alarm yeah it makes sense you're a clockwork soul therefore alarm it's thematic but for you especially since you don't have ritual casting you cannot cast spells ritually this spell is just complete waste. I don't think uh, you need it. Now, uh, something that I need to add here is that uh, I would also swap protection from evil and good um, with uh, Featherfall. Now, I picked Featherfall anyway for this character, but... Um, I think it, it makes sense for you to pick Featherfall with the, with this Clockwork Magic feature instead of your ordinary spellcasting sorcerer feature. Uh, why? Well, because later on we will be able to to swap both Dispel Magic and Protection from Energy for uh, Blink and uh, for Glyp of Warding, right? So, uh, because of the fact that you cannot uh, swap, for example, Protection from Evil and Good, which is a level 1 spell, with Glyph of Warding, which is a level 3 spell, right? You cannot do that, even though for some reason I did it here, I don't know. Um, so yeah, uh, Dispel Magic with Glyph of Warding for storing a bunch of uh, buffs into a book. Now, Glyph of Warding. Now, this spell, you don't necessarily have to take it. You don't have to take the Glyph of Warding if your DM doesn't allow the... A bag of holding plus glyph of warding combo. Now I'm not gonna go too deeply into how that works. Let me just kind of try to briefly explain it. Um, yeah, I'm gonna waste a little bit of a time on it. So um, this is your bag of holding, right? This is how it looks from inside. Uh, maybe like this a little bit. Doesn't matter, right? There's there's some space. Um, what you do is you put a book, right, this is your book, in it, and then you put yourself in it. So this is you, I have a terrible drawing skills, so just ignore it, it's a nose, these are your fingers, yeah, I, uh, let's just say that I did not go to the school of arts or, or or anything like that so now that both you and the book are in the bag of holding you are gonna be casting glyph of warding on that book so let me let me let me repeat this while both you and the book are inside of the bag of holding you cast glyph of warding on the book 
inside of the book, whatever you want to call it, right? Let me actually open up the spell so that you're not just randomly listening to me, right? Let's, uh, how, do, how do I do this? Yeah, yeah, so, um, let's, let's do it like that, just like this. Uh, I don't think I put it, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't have. Well, what's up with my keyboard? Jesus. Uh, glyph of wording, there we go. By the way, if you're listening to this, uh, if you want me in the future to live stream these, um, uh, I might actually even post a comment down below, let me know. If, if, if you would prefer it that way, instead of listening to me, to the pre-recorded uh, video. So anyway, what you want is the spell glyph, right? So you store your, I don't know, um, fire shield, you store your uh, greater invisibility, you store your blink, you store all of your buff spells, darkness, all of that. You store that inside of the book, right? And then you have the book of glyphs, the, the book of glyphs of wording. I don't know how it's called, but that's basically what you do. And then you go out of the... How do I erase this? Is there a thing to clear? Yeah. No. Anyway. Yeah, you get the point. You... You are going to be going outside of the bag of holding. You're going to be holding the bag of holding. I... Yeah, whatever. You're gonna be carrying the bag of holding, but the book remains inside of the bag of holding. So, why am I saying all of this? Um, don't watch the porn, please. Um, I'm joking, there's no... Yeah, uh, D&D Beyond uh, Items. Is it items? Yeah, it is, okay. So, uh, magic items. Why am I saying all of this? Well, a uh, bag of holding is the extra planar, extra dimensional something, something, something. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, hold on, hold on. There we go. Pl um, nope. I'm actually trying to find. Yeah, so. Uh, it doesn't say that it's an extra dimensional space. But for example, if you go in the portable hole. Uh, and read it. It says. Placing a portable hole inside an extra dimensional space created by bag of holding. So extra dimensional space created by bag of holding. You get the point, right? Bag of holding, portable hole, and handy uh, haversack, all of these three items are basically kind of the same. Different dimensions, kind of slightly different uses. But uh, bag of holding is the uncommon one, right? The uncommon uh, portable hole is rare, and then handy haversack is, I think, also rare. So, you have the, the most... So, obviously, finding a bag, bag of holding is the easiest thing to do compared to the other, to all of the three. Um, therefore, I mean, even if you have, for example, an artificer in a party who can make you a bag of holding, that's even better. You don't even have to rely on a DM to give you the bag of holding. So why am I telling you all of this? The reason I'm telling you all of this is because, as I've said, the reason to take bag of holding, a glyph of warning spell with your, um, sorry, with your clockwork magic is because of all of these interactions. Now... A lot of DMs flat out ban this combo because it legitimately breaks the concentration spell limitations. So make sure you know where you're at with your DM. Because, yes, sure, while you are you are um, meeting the limits of the spell, uh, the limits of the spell state that the, uh, the, the, the object mustn't be moved more than 10 feet in any, in any, in any direction. Hold on, let me... There we go. Uh, if the surface or object is moved more than 10 feet from uh, from where you cast the spell, the glyph is broken. But you are casting the spell within the bag of holding, right? And the bag of holding is extra dimensional space. And then that extra dimensional space, it's in the it's it's not in the dimension that you're. It's inside of some extra dimension, right? So while we can talk about whether while you're moving the bag of holding. Everything inside of the bag of holding is moving. We can talk about it for like three hours. My interpretation is 
that this extra dimensional space is kind of like fixed in some e external dimension. Um, while obviously the bag of holding is moving, the extra dimensional space inside of it is not moving. So therefore the book is not moving. I don't know, it's up to discussion. Some people are using this, a lot of people are using this. Um, you decide, whatever, right? Uh, talk to your DM as always. Um, uh, yeah, so... Uh, with uh, Blink, we just need to make that edit. Did I screw up? Yeah, I did, okay. Blink, what, what? There we go. Now it's fixed. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's it for that. Um, one notable thing in here is Wall of Force, which is legitimately one of the most broken spells in the game. Um, it's a level 5 spell that just completely breaks encounters. Uh, it's present on the wizard and, um, and uh, Oath of Redemption Paladin and then uh, Artificer list. But obviously only wizards use it all the time because it's a... Only wizards can cast it as a character level 9. But now you have that privilege as well because once you get to a sorcerer level 9, you can cast Wall of Force as well. Um... I'm not gonna go talk too much about it, it's legitimately broken, cannot be dispelled, must be disintegrated in order to be destroyed, so you need to use a level 6 spell to destroy a level 5 spell, and then this level 5 spell makes a total cover, uh, prevents you from casting spells in and out because it's a total cover, it's just completely nuts, it's, it's, it's part of the game, it's you learn to, to deal with it once you get to level 9 characters and above, level 9 wizards and now level 9 sorcerers. But um, yeah, it's it's kind of bullshit. It's kind of bullshit and um, I've already thought about how to nerf it and I'm pretty close to something. Which I might even make a video about uh, how to nerf Wall of Force without making it useless. So yeah, we'll see. Maybe in the future. We'll see. We'll see. Anyway. That's it for the level nine, level one feature. Anyway, so font of magic, pretty straightforward. Uh, nothing too much about. Oh yeah, I completely forgot about the restore balance. Now I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether to think about this feature as overpowered, powerful, or just very good. Um, I'm kind of torn because yes, while it does manipulate the D20. It does uh, manipulate the advantage-disadvantage mechanic. At the same time, it's only up to your proficiency bonus, so you cannot really spam it. Um, you know, it just... It's gonna be useful, don't get me wrong. Once you, once you get restrained and then you try to do something or something gives you disadvantage on saving throws or whatever, whatever... This is gonna be very, very useful, but at the same time, I mean, it's only cancelling the disadvantage or advantage. It doesn't guarantee anything. It just guarantees that the enemy doesn't roll the high, doesn't use the higher roll, and you don't use the lower roll, lower roll. But you can still roll, you know, two twenties, or you can still roll uh, two ones. So. Depends. It re it's really situational, right? Um, that th therefore I cannot really decide how to think about it, because D and D is a low sample size game, where in any given combat encounter, in any given encounter, social or exploration, you won't be rolling more than like I don't know ten D twenties, even if right. So ten D twenties is not nearly enough of a sample size. To be statistically significant, therefore these kinds of features, which are all, which are already limited by your proficiency bonus, which is plus two to plus six, they are very swingy. They can be very swingy. They can be very completely almost irrelevant, right? Depending on the outcomes, right? So Phantom Magic, very important. You need your sorcery points for everything. Uh, Meta Magic, as I've said before, quickened and. Uh, 
Uh, why am I? What? What? Why is it only showing? Oh yeah, there we go. Uh, so meta magic, obviously these are. Oh, these are the optional class features. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are the two. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be taking either one of these, even though seeking spell makes a little bit of a sense. Um, I wouldn't be taking it. I think you have enough accuracy via your darkness plus devil side plus elven accuracy combo, or just. Greater Invisibility plus Elven Accuracy combo, or your Trance of Order level 14 feature, right? So I wouldn't be taking... What I would be taking at level 3 is Quickened and, twin and Twinned, which has proven to be a very, very effective uh, low-level Sorcerer combo of Metamagics. Quickened for obvious reasons, Eldritch Blast, and then Twinned. Twinned you can use with a lot of spells. Um... Any spell that has a single target, let's let's just go through the ones that are given to you by by uh, Clockwork Magic. For example, you can you can twin protection from evil and good. I actually used twin protection from evil and good myself when I was playing a, a divine divine paladin uh, shadow sorcerer uh, character Sorcadin. I was twinning protection from evil and good all the time. Because we were fighting demons and 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 undead all the time, uh, you can um, protection from uh, you can twin lesser restoration. You can um, you can you can twin freedom of movement. You can twin haste. You can. There's a lot of spells that you can twin, and really, there's no reason not to take it, other than maybe subtle spell. But the problem with subtle spell is that unless on low levels you're constantly dealing with social encounters where casting magic casting spells in the open can be problematic can cause a lot of problems to you and the party subtle spell is kind of a dead meta magic until let's say for this particular character level five level no level hold on level um level seven pretty much because the main use in combat, for example, for subtle, for subtle spell is to use it with counter spell. So you cast your counter spell, and then you don't want to get, you don't want your enemy spellcaster to counter spell you. Well, you just subtly counter spell, right? So now that your enemy doesn't even know that you're counter spelling his or her or its spell, you're pretty much just left your own devices, your own ability score rolls, which you know, can be good, can be bad, can be can be bad, depends. But I mean, whatever, right? Um, you have your magical guidance to to to, to deal with that. Uh, more on that later. Um, so that's kind of like where I'm torn in between. I would still take subtle spell at level ten with this character, but if you're constantly dealing with a lot of social encounters, like a crap ton of social encounters, where you can kind of find a use for that suggestion spell for example you 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 take that suggestion spell but you don't want anybody knowing that you're casting suggestion spell let me actually open up suggestion spell so that you know that what am i even talking about right um so, uh, casting it subtly uh, casting su suggestion with a subtle spell uh, is uh, pretty pretty potent uh and uh yeah i mean it makes sense it will depend on what kind of campaign you're playing in so I made it this way, level 3, quickened and twin, but I would not hold it against you to leave twin meta magic to level 10 and then take subtle spell immediately at level 3. Again, if you're dealing with a lot of uh, social encounters and then you are in it for like spells like suggestion, which you cast using uh, subtle spell meta magic. Now, it does have material component, but um, usually the DMs will let you... Uh, will let you uh, cast it uh, some like sleight of hand or something for the material component to be imperceptible right uh, obviously this is not the only spell that you can you, you, you can cast there's a lot of spells right so uh, it depends it depends right I mean you can even go as as, 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 as little as, as friends right uh, even though it's probably not the best thing to do because then the target of the spell knows that you did it but uh, it's it, it's a thing that you can do right I mean Depends, depends. Anyway, heightened spell, I would leave this for, I don't even know when you get this, level 17, level 18, whatever. Um, 
uh, it improves spells like Banishment or Tasha's Mind Whip. The spells that rely on enemy failing their saving throw against your spell saving throw uh, DC, spell casting DC. Um, there's other options. I mean, you can take Empowered Spell if you really want your Eldritch Blast damage to be potent. For example, re-rolling all, all of those ones and twos. Um, as, I, as I've said in here, right? Um, empowered right i mean that it, it's i made it this way but um it's it's it, it definitely can be also something like it, it can be something like this right i mean this is not this is not bad um this is not bad but now you're like you're you're putting a lot of your different resources towards just one purpose i would still prefer once you get to these high level 17 18 character uh, character level uh, sorcerer levels to take to take a meta magic that synergizes with your other spells instead of just like Eldritch Blast, right? Um, oh my God, this this drilling is just completely making me insane. Uh, sorcerer's versatility, you're probably not gonna need it, but um, hey, if you find that at any point your twin meta magic uh, becomes kind of useless and you would prefer to have subtle. Or heck, even 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 heightened meta magic, you can do it now Be because Tasha gives you optional class features to do that. Cantrips, I don't think you're gonna be replacing cantrips, but uh, maybe if you fail, maybe if you figure out, oh yeah, maybe this cantrip is a bit better because I have to constantly, you know, I have to constantly clean myself. Therefore, prestidigitation makes more sense than whatever else you picked. Sure, why not? Right? It's it's optional. It gives you that flexibility, uh, even though you're probably not gonna need Already covered Elven, Elven Accuracy, I think this feat is just pure power for this, this kind of character, where you have a lot of attack rolls, you have a lot of like uh, uh, fl uh, fixed damage increases via Agonizing Blast and uh, Hexblade's Curse, making your Eldritch Blast super potent in terms of damage. Uh, and then obviously I mean rolling those critical hits even though your Eldritch Blast is only like 1d10 so it becomes 2d10 Hey still that's a lot of damage um, Obviously it's, it synergizes with your charisma score and uh, all of that hopefully you can hear me Because this drilling is absolutely deafening. I can barely hear myself Honestly, I'm not even lying. I can barely hear myself speaking. I have to scream a magical guidance now this is uh, the most obvious use for this feature is um, is your counter spell and dispel magic uh, you cast your counter spell you uh, roll your ability check and then your ability check fails right so let me actually open up uh, uh, the mechanic for counter spell and dispel magic is the same but uh, counter spell is in the middle of the combat while dispel magic is like usually not but it depends right uh, this spell magic can be used in the middle of the combat if if one of your allies is affected by like a bunch of spells, right? Uh, so you interrupt a creature if the spell is of of a third level, a third level or lower, automatically ends it. If it's a fourth level and you use a third level spell slot, uh, you need to make an ability check. Now, obviously, if you use a higher level slot, it it still ends it uh, automatically, but it depends. Now you have to think. Okay, what's the spell that the enemy is casting, right? So if you use a third level slot, you still have to make an ability check to to counter spell that level 5 of all of force, or I don't know, like level 6 disintegrate or something. Level 7 finger of death. So now you roll your ability score check, and you fail. You can retry with just one sorcery points and re-roll the d20. Um, but the good thing about this is that you know that you failed, right? You know that if you rolled 16 and uh, you still didn't manage to counter spell, you know that you failed. So now you're thinking, well, what's my odds of rolling like 17 or above? If the, if the odds are low, then maybe conserving the sorcery point might be prudent. But let's say, let's say you rolled, uh, let's say you rolled uh, a, a 9, right? And uh, you know that it's a no it's not a third level spell, but you're kind of assuming that it could be a fourth, a fourth or a fifth level spell. Now it might be prudent 
to spend one sorcery point on that counter spell. Obviously, this works on anything else. Uh, it could be, it could be you crossing a, a big chasm, like there's a hundred feet fall down below, and then you're rolling your athletics, and um, that athletics check fails. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't want to fall down hundred feet down below, right? I mean, you 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 pretty much want to remain on that rope. You you want to remain on that shaky bridge. Or whatever passing or, or some fallen tree so this is universally applicable but th these would be some kinds of uses where uh, it would be the most obvious to use this right uh, bastion of law now this is something that you're gonna be using on lower levels probably because it just decreases the damage coming your way and especially if you're playing in a party that doesn't have a lot of where if it, okay not even that if especially if you're playing under a dm who doesn't uh who who isn't shy of just constantly targeting you or not just you who is just agnostic in terms of who he he or she targets so if you're the closest thing to an enemy and you have like 20 hit points even though that barbarian has 60 the dm is not gonna care he's he or she is gonna attack you and in those cases, Bastion of Law on lower levels and even on higher levels does make some sense. Now, it does use sorcery points, which directly impacts your damage via Quicken Spell or anything else that you do via your metamagics. But um, again, if you are constantly, if your hit points are constantly the, the resource that's the most challenged resource this makes sense i mean you have to adapt to your dm's play style you have to adapt to your party you have to adapt to all of those uh, variables therefore this kind of feature is not going to be universally useful or powerful to every iteration of this character out there but it's more or less going to be useful to almost any every iteration of character out there at some point in the game right um Again, level 8, Warcaster, pretty, pretty, pretty... This is a feat that I take for almost every spellcaster. Uh, it's just so good, and you're usually concentrating on something. You usually have your uh, uh, attacks of opportunity to do with your booming blades and whatnot. That um, I just don't see a reason not to take this feat. Uh, level 12, again, as I said, Meta Magic Adept. Don't really need it. But I like extra meta magic options. Two sorcery points on top, not much, but hey, it's one extra use of quicken meta magic. You can even bastion of Lloyd if you need it. I mean, give yourself a little bit of an extra buffer of uh, damage, of like uh, hit points, whatever, damage uh, mitigation. It can be look, look, it's like every bit helps. And uh, this kind of character, I think, I think, I think this is the kind of feat to take with this kind of character. Period. Period. So, um, yeah, anyway, um, oh, where was I? Okay, yeah, so, uh, we are, we are getting here, Trans of Order, the most important feature of this whole, uh, character. The very core of this character concept, it is a high level, uh, but once you activate it, so, let, let's, let, let's say it like this, right? So, you are a minimum of level 16 or 15 when you have this, right? So minimum level 15, 16. That makes your proficiency bonus a plus 5. Right. Sorry, my nose is congested again. Anyway, yeah, so your proficiency bonus is a plus 5. Your charisma score... Um, is um, is 18 so it's um, plus 4 that means with a plus 4 profic plus 5 proficiency and plus 4 from charisma you have a plus 9 plus 9 uh, to hit with spell attacks obviously eldritch brrrr Last is a spell attack spell. 
So, you roll a minimum of 10 on a d20, right? So it's a 10. You have a plus 9 to hit, so that's plus 9. At level 15 or 16, it's a minimum of 19 to hit. Minimum. Um, right, so that's level 15, 16. At level 17, your proficiency bonus becomes plus 6. Because for every character of level 17, proficiency bonus is plus 6. So it is obviously now, uh, following all this logic, your minimum to hit is um, 20, right? Because it's one higher than 19. And then obviously uh, at level at level 18, so two levels of sorcerer, uh, two levels of warlock, and then uh, 16 levels of uh, of sorcerer. So that's level 18. Your charisma becomes 20, right? Charisma score is up to 20. Uh, Uh, so your uh, char charisma bonus is plus five. So your minimum to hit is now twenty-one. The same as I as I've said in the. I don't know how to. But yeah, that's why I said twenty-one to hit minimum. Obviously, you would need. You will need 18 levels minimum for, for, for this to be true, but uh, it's possible. I mean, some people do play at at uh, level 18, level 20, right? So, obviously, even before, come on. I mean, even at level 15, 16, once you get your Trans of Order, 19 to hit minimum, that's a lot. That's, that's a, that hits a whole lot of enemies. Level 17, 20 to hit even more, 21 even more, right? So, uh, that's pretty much the whole shtick about this uh, feature. It's very powerful. Uh, let me not even... I, I, I focused on the attack rolls. But this is... This is big too. Like, attack rolls against you cannot benefit from advantage either. So, even if you're restrained, even if you're, I don't know, prone, even if you're whatever, whatever, the attack rolls against you do not benefit from advantage so with your your uh, armor class being what like let's say a breastplate 14 right let's say you take breastplate right ac even at even at this high level so breastplate is uh 14 plus 2 dex uh so that's that's 16 uh you have your shield which is another Shield plus two, which is another eight, which is another two, which is eighteen, and then you have your shield spell, which is plus five, right? And that's equal. That equals to what? To uh, twenty-three, right? Yeah. So twenty-three AC minimum, without any magical armor, without any whatever, whatever. That's a very high AC, even for level seventeen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Sure, a lot of enemies are going to be hitting you, but at least those hits are not going to be with advantage. Therefore, it's like a 50-50% chance. Let's say something with a plus 11 to hit attacks you. That's like roughly half, uh, roughly 50% chance to hit you if you activate your shield spell. Um, without advantage, with advantage, that's like uh, like 70-80% chance to hit you. Without advantage, again, it's like. 50%, right? So, it's uh, pretty, pretty good. Uh, pretty, pretty good. Alright, so that's it for level uh, that, for that, for this. Obviously, at level 18, which is basically your level 20 character, you get this. Um, it's not really synergistic with the main idea of this character, but um, it's still good. I mean, the, the basic effect of this feature is powerful. Uh, other than this, which rarely comes into effect. Um, this is powerful. That's powerful even more. So, um, yeah. So, I, I mean, 
this is one of the reasons why I decided not to take the third level in Warlock, for example, because I think you will benefit from this. If you are a level 20 character, you will benefit from this more than like more uh, than like second level Warlock spell slots, right? And 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 your pack boot. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. Let me know in the comments down below. Uh, Hexblade Warlock, obviously. Uh, two levels only for for the invocations. Uh, not gonna talk too much about these. A couple extra spells. Higher hit point die. Proficiencies. That, this doesn't matter as much as uh, this. Which uh, gives you... I don't know why it doesn't say... Oh, there we go. Hex Warrior. There we go. So... It gives you the medium armor proficiency, that's the one that you need. Pack magic, pretty good. Uh, you can turn your spell slots into sorcery points. Uh, you get a couple extra spells. Uh, all of that is good. Now, obviously it would be better if you take 5 levels in Warlock and these become uh, like 3rd level Warlock slots. Instead of just 1st level. But um, in my own opinion... Uh, you, you take the shield from the list, and then you take your Hexblade's Curse, and then you take your Hex Warrior, which gives you medium armor proficiency, and that's, that together with Agonizing Blast and Devil's Side, in my own opinion, is enough. You could go five levels in Warlock, uh, that gives you, that gives you one extra invocation, which can be anything... Repelling Blast, Eldritch Side, Book of Ancient Secrets with Pact of the Tome, Pact of the Chain, Voice of the Chain, Master Invocation. Even if you take Pact of the Talisman, which does synergize, nice, synergize nicely with, for example, Magical Guidance, you can give yourself a lot of bonuses to your ability score uh, checks when you cast Counterspell and, and, and things like that. Um, again, I think, I think two levels is enough. But uh, if you do decide to go to 5, the reason, the main reason to do that is for the spells. I'm just gonna quickly go to, to the 3rd level spells. Spirit Shroud, right? It's a big damage boost, I already talked about it. It's not the most... You still deal more damage with the Simulacrum. Uh, because your Simulacrum can double the output of your Eldritch Blasts. And it still counts as a little bit more damage. But this is a big damage boost. And it's one of the reasons to go... In a, uh, to a 5th level Warlock, because uh, Spirit Shroud, unfortunately, is not a spell that war that sorcerers can learn, which is a big sad to me, and um, yeah, you need 5 levels of Warlock minimum to, to learn Spirit Shroud for that big, big damage boost. Um, finally, the reason that I think it's not that good to go that route, even though it's very, very good, is because of the uh, 8th and 9th level spells. I mean, Earthquake, Time Stop, Wish. These spells are just... You cannot get these spells as a 15th level war... Uh, 15th level... Uh, uh, sorry, you, you can get Earthquake. Sorry, my bad. You can get Earthquake, but you cannot get Time Stop and Wish if, you, uh, if you're a 15th level uh, Sorcerer. You need to be minimum a 17th level Sorcerer to get Time Stop and Wish, which is, again... The reason why I think the uh, split, uh, the 18, 18 2 split is slightly better at higher levels than, than, than the 15-5, right? Uh, but neither split is bad, it's just different. You know, this is more of a Eldritch Blast build. This is more of a, I can Eldritch Blast, but I can also do a ton of other shit. A ton of other shit. Um, so yeah, let's quickly go through the spells. Uh, cantrips, chill touch as usual to prevent healing. Green flame blade sometimes if you are uh, dealing with a lot of um, enemies that are surrounding you. Mage hand, pretty useful. Uh, utility mending, I mean you're a clockwork, you should be able to fix stuff. Mold earth, shape water, pretty good for manipulating, terraforming, you know, whatever kind of terrain you're, you're dealing with. Either it's like a water campaign or, or, or a campaign on land. These cantrips come, come very, very useful. And uh, the more I play the game, the more I almost always take these kinds of cantrips when I, whenever I can. Uh, because there are so many uses that you can use them for. Because of the fact that they are free to cast. There's no spell slots, there's no limits to the amount of times you can cast them. I mean, you can build whole modes with this. You can build bridges across like rivers. 
it's crazy these cantrips are actually super powerful um and yeah i recently saw this cantrip deal 37 cold damage to a fire elemental two rounds in a row so like almost yeah so 70 70 plus damage with just a mere cantrip to a fire elemental and by the way the the character that was casting it was a level one wizard uh don't ask me why we played one shot we rolled for levels he rolled the one i rolled 11 somebody rolled 15 so yeah it was it was a crazy party there was like a level one wizard level 11 monk level 15 wizard crazy anyway that's a story for another for another video eldritch blast i mean do i even need to right i mean <laughs> That's, uh, oh, that's a Warlock, sorry, yeah. Uh, Warlock spells, Eldritch Blast, pretty, pretty. Nothing too much to say about it, right? Um, Synergy with Warcaster, Booming Blade, that's the reason to take it, I think. Because you can uh, Booming Blade with your uh, Tax of Opportunity. Friends, I mean, eventually you have to take something, but... Uh, you don't have to, but if you are going for that 5th uh, level Warlock, you can kind of take this. I mean, you, you need to take something, so I guess Friends makes the most sense. If you take Pact of the Tome, I would take these three, even though you can kind of combine them with the with the Sorcerer. Uh, uh, Pact of the Tome is usually the Pact Boon I go with the war with the Sorlock, uh, that, that takes three or more levels in, in, uh, in Warlock. Because I like to have all of these extra cantrips and um, all of those invocations that give me extra spells. Something that sorcerers struggle with is spells, right? Spell variety. Uh, but, I mean, you don't have to. This, these are just my thoughts. This is You can definitely deviate from this as much or as, li as little as you want. First level spells. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, this is going to be slightly weird because... Um, I wasn't able to... So here. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to replace these spells with the other spells from, from the Wizard, Warlock and Sorcerer, uh, Abjuration and Transmutation list of spells. The the D, D Beyond character creator doesn't allow me to do that. So I will have to homebrew it. I will have to like make a homebrew class, homebrew homebrew subclass, make it public, fix all of these spell. I don't know. It will, yeah. I, I will try it later, but for now, you're, it's gonna be a, li a little bit wonky. Uh, but yeah, we will manage. We will manage. Um, obviously, uh, magic missile on low levels. You will. F you don't have it now. This is a level twenty character, but at level one, guaranteed damage. It kind of fits the theme of the character, right? I mean, you're going for that guaranteed hit. And what better guarantee than Magic Missile, right? Uh, Mage Armor on only at, le at level 1. <clears throat> Once you get your Hex Warrior feature. Once you get that Medium Armor proficiency, you don't need Mage Armor. So you need you, you swap it for something else. Featherfall. Um, so I will remove this. I need to put something else in here. Um... So for now, we are going to say uh, s something because uh, to swap with uh, this spell magic later. Uh, because as I've said before, uh, instead of instead of your uh, protection from evil and good, you can take uh, Featherfall, which is a transmutation uh, reaction spell on all of these lists, I think. Um, so, yeah, something to... I'm gonna... If I remember, I'm gonna fix it later. Yeah, so this edited version of the file is gonna end up on the Patreon as well. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. I mean, <laughs> why Why would I not do that, right? Uh, something to swap with Dispel Magic later. I mean, I'm thinking... I'm thinking Chromatic Orb or... Um, I don't know. I, I will have to think about it. But for now, I'm gonna leave question marks. <clears throat> I mean, I can even... Hold on. Let's let's try to do it now, actually. Do we have a level? Yep. Uh, 
remove this. What would make more sense? Let's see. This is you, you take this with the clockwork magic. Not really. Chaos bolt makes no sense. Chromatic orb, as I said, does make sense. But um, one thing that people forget is you need a diamond worth at least 50 gold uh, gold pieces. Now it's not a consumable diamond, but you still need it. Um, hmm. You could take expeditious retreat. Like, or false life. Yeah. I would even, I would, I would go for like false life. False life and, uh... Because both of these spells, um, either extra HP or increased mobility will help your low level survival, right? I mean, those first two or three levels are uh, are really, really, you know, well, even, even four or five levels for like D6 classes like sorcerers are very, very hard. So yeah, something like that would make more sense. Uh, and then we have Warlock, obviously Shield, um, it's like Shield and Hex, what else, right? And Armor of Agathis at level, at, at Warlock level 2. Um, shield for obvious reasons, Hex for obvious reasons, and then Armor of Agathis. A little bit of an extra temporary hit points. It kind of does, it does fight with False Life. Which is again maybe more reason to go for expeditious retreat because then you use, use you have your armor of Agathis for extra hit points and then you have expeditious retreat for your uh, for your uh, increased mobility. Also, armor of Agathis deals deals damage uh, and it does scale with your sorcerer spell slots, so you can cast it with higher sorcerer spell slots. And all of that stuff. My voice is going slightly out of commission, so I'm gonna try to, to do this quickly. Um, Pact of the Tome. I usually go for Detect Magic Comprehend Languages or something like that. Whatever you choose, it's gonna make sense. Alarm, maybe a little bit more because you're a clockwork, so maybe a little bit of a more thematic choice. But at the same time... You know, wh whatever you choose is gonna be good, and these are these are my choices. These are my recommendations. Level two, oh man, my 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 voice is absolutely shot already. So darkness, obviously, it synergizes with devil's sight, and allows you to have that super advantage with your uh, with your elven accuracy feat. So basically, you're rolling effectively three d twenty on all of your attack rolls, and you have many attack rolls via eldritch blast uh, uh, cantrip. Uh, Tasha's Mind Whip is not present here because you will unlearn it, but it's one of those spells on lower levels that I really uh, that I really think you should take because it's an intelligence saving throw. What? But it's a sorcerer spell. What are you? Oh man, what? Uh, it is not showing them. Anyway. Uh, it's an intelligence saving throw. Uh, a, not a lot of monsters are proficient or even like have high intelligence uh, ability scores to begin with. A little bit of a damage. It completely ruins their action economy. I don't know why I can't show it in here. Maybe I can... Hold on, hold on. Maybe I can show it in this way. Oh, man. There we go. So, uh, if they fail, which they have a high likelihood of failing, uh, they can only use an action or a bonus action or a move. So, they cannot move and attack. They cannot misty step and attack. They cannot attack and move. They cannot misty step and move, right? So, it significantly, it significantly hampers their action economy. Uh, if they succeed, sure, but they still take a little bit of a damage. Uh, this spell does synergize very, very nicely with the heightened, heightened spell meta magic. And even though I removed it from the final list of spells for the level twenty character, uh, uh, for the level twenty version of this character, 
I don't think you will necessarily, you know, like, uh, leaving this spell on your, even, even, even at level 20 of this character, is not necessarily a bad move, because you can upcast it, affect more creatures, uh, even if you cast it at the lowest level, level 2, you can still twin it, um, and uh, yeah, but it's a very, very, it's a very nice spell for a sorcerer specifically, especially if you do take that heightened spell meta magic, which I did take for uh, for this character, right? Because you get you 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 give disadvantage on the intelligence saving throw, and they most monsters and enemies have very bad intelligence saving throws. Now you give them disadvantage, they are most likely failing. Now you're dealing damage to them and I mean, uh, seriously, a uh, hampering their action economy. Misty Step, obviously, I mean, this is one of the most, the best spells for for movement. I don't know why I don't have it in here. Probably because of the Clockwork, meta mag clockwork Magic feature disallowing me. Oh, there we go. There there is, yeah. So, bonus action, teleport 30 feet, pretty good. Um... It's one of the rare teleport spells that actually gets you out of trouble. For example, if you get affected by a wall of force, if you are get if you get trapped in the wall of force, Misty Step still works because it's a range of self, and the target is you. So you you can target yourself, and you teleport 30 feet on the other end of the wall of force. So mirror image, it's not on the list of spells here. This is the spell that you take lower on lower levels, and then you swap for better spells, spells later on. On lower levels, not a lot of monsters, if any, will be able to discern illusions from real spells from uh, real you. So therefore, uh, I think this is a very nice spell to have on low levels uh, because it's very hard to hit you. It's very hard to hit you with the shield. Now it's even harder to hit you with with mirror image. Uh, Warlock suggestion and mind spike. Obviously, if you take fifth level, uh, third and fifth level, warlock, uh, you take these two spells. Not gonna talk too much about it. Suggestion, one of the best level two control spells, and mind spike. I mean, invisible creatures. It kind of tracks them easier. Sorcerer level three counter spell. Obviously, I mean. Uh, any character that has access to this spell is you kind of need to have it because if you don't have it and need it oh man like you're gonna be so sorry I recently played the level 7 Sorlock. I was within range for a counter spell and an enemy casted Cone of Cold and I didn't have counter spell because I thought ah well who cares I'm not gonna take counter spell because there's not gonna be and lo and behold there was a spell that was cast on us. Uh, it dealt a lot of damage to us. I could have prevented it with a counter spell. So I think this is the spell that even if you never use it, you just have to have it on, on, on you. Uh, haste. There's a reason to take this spell primarily for Twin, because you can cast it on two people. Uh, Sorcerer is the only character, only class that can do that period. And... Uh, Sure, it, it might reduce your own damage because you're not casting darkness or hex for your own damage. But if you cast it on a paladin and you cast it on a barbarian or a fighter, uh, they are going to be so much more effective at what they do because you give them bonus movement speed. That means they can close the distance with the fleeing enemies. Uh, AC means they're going to be hit less often and uh, obviously advantage on deck saves. And obviously one more action, which usually is used for attack. Sometimes maybe, maybe, maybe dash or disengage if they really need to. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's... If you're playing a 5th level sorcerer uh, who has twinned meta magic, I'm not saying you should have this, but if you have twin meta magic, there's a very good chance that haste spell is gonna be a force multiplier unlike anything that you anything else that you can do at uh, fifth level you will be you will be noticing the lack of fireball and um, yes I do think that fifth and sixth level sorcerers can play that th their characters without fireball you can take the fireball I'm not gonna hate you for it I'm not gonna say that's bad 
In fact, it's probably gonna be good. But uh, for this particular character, I decided that Fireball doesn't really make the most thematic sense. And I think you can manage just fine without it. Uh, even though it's one of the most powerful damaging spells in the game. What can I say? Obviously, Spirit Shroud already talked about it previously. If you do take your uh, Warlock up to level 5, you will be able to learn it. It's gonna be a massive, massive damage improvement and uh, I cannot type because this freaking drilling is driving driving me nuts um, it's like 9 a.m. and they're they, they, they're gonna be drilling until yeah a long time anyway well, who cares you, you know what the spirit shroud does now level 4 greater invisibility is basically plan B whenever those pesky devils who have devil's sight right I mean they're devils they can see through your magical darkness or whatever other enemy that can see through magical darkness or perceive you either tremor sense blind sight um now if they if they have true sight they will be able to perceive you even with greater invisibility but in a lot of cases true sight is a rare trait it's like a cr cr 17 plus kind of monsters have true sights and even a lot of them don't so it's it's really like a boss type of sense um so for most enemies greater invisibility will be your plan b that will work with your elven accuracy and also if you cast it with the twin mana magic you cannot just give yourself invisibility you can give invisibility to one of your allies so yeah one more reason to to take the twin mana magic uh, dimension door, obviously, big ass teleport, whatever, like three, four, five hundred feet away. I don't even know. Uh, uh, five hundred feet, yeah. So, you know, you're one of the few sorcerers who can afford squeezing this spell into your kit. Uh, again, you can take fireball instead of dimension door. It's not gonna be a bad choice. But I think Dimension Door, particularly if there's nobody else who has this spell in a party. If you have like a Druid, a Fighter, a Barbarian, and a freaking Artificer in a party, I think you kinda gotta take this. Specifically because, for example, in that case, you don't even need Fireball with the Druid and Artificer in a party, right? I mean, they're gonna be perfectly capable of... The dealing, uh, you know, dealing with, with, with a lot of enemies on their own. So, you leave masses of enemies for them to damage, and you take some utility spells, teleport spells, whatever you want to call them, like Dimension Door. Uh, Fire Shield, even though it's not present on this list, you, you should be able to take it. Uh, why? Well, because, I mean, you have your, uh, what's, what's the name? You have your uh, clockwork magic feature, and then obviously fire shield is somewhere in there. You can take it, you can swap it, whatever. Um, I wasn't able to figure out a way to put it on the list in here, so you just gotta believe me that you can take this. I don't only really take this when you get the time stop spell, because armor of Agathis can, can do a similar thing that the fire shield does. But it can almost do it even better with a with, with 4th level uh, slot. So, yeah, it, it depends. It's something to do with your action. But um, it's, not, it's not necessarily... I'm not gonna say the best, but it's like... It's just kind of something that you do if you have nothing else to do. With your time stop turns, right? 5th uh, level spells, animate objects, I mean, it's so much thematically fitting for this character to animate objects, you're a clockwork soul, there's gotta be a little bit of that construct summoning magic, and then on the other hand, I mean, 10, 10 constructs with 20 HP, 18 AC, who deal 1d4+, plus. that's a lot of damage, even though it's non-magic damage, uh, fighting against enemies who have resistances or even immunities, significantly di diminishes the effectiveness of this spell still even with resistances it's gonna be a lot of damage because like um it's 10 i, I think um uh, remember 10 non-magical objects yeah so tiny it's gonna be 10 uh if all of them hit i mean i know not all of them are gonna hit but chance to hit is pretty high plus eight to hit 
it's pretty pretty high a lot of them are gonna be hitting and uh, let's say just just seven out of ten of them hit that's uh let's let's take six right 1d4 2.5 uh, plus 4 is 6.5 times 6 that's 39 damage dude even re with resistance that's like half that's 19 damage every turn with your i think bonus action yeah so with your bonus action you're dealing 19 damage with a single casting of a fifth level spell slot uh in a in a prolonged fight where you already can't tell there's gonna be seven rounds eight rounds however many rounds this is a spell that makes sense why because first it's gonna preserve a lot of your um, sorcery points that you would be otherwise wasting on uh, burning on quick and uh, eldritch blast it's gonna be able to deal with the masses of enemies that are spread out scattered everywhere across the room that you're fighting in um there's a lot of situations that this spell does make more sense than uh, just quickening your eldritch blast sure again immunities to non-magic damage resistances to non-magic damage will ruin the damage of this spell but you know it's it's there's not a lot of situations that this spell can cannot be at least somewhat useful synaptic static it's one of those spells that i recommended previously it's decent damage big debuff psychic damage is not often resisted or even immune to there are obviously monsters that are but not not very many and uh, intelligence saving throw also um so it 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 affects it it's got a very very damaging damaging effect because it affects attack rolls ability checks uh it debuffs spellcasters um and then obviously if you pair it with heightened meta magic which i already mentioned um let me just quickly open it once again heightened meta magic you give disadvantage to one particular target of of this spell chances are that target is gonna fail and when it fails it's it's significantly debuffed dealt a nice bit of damage uh i like this spell very very much the only downside of this spell the only reason that i didn't make it like you know maybe maybe this or that you know really that i that i think it's not really that good is because it doesn't scale it's a fifth level slot a spell that doesn't scale with like sixth and higher level slots that's the only downside i would like to have at least a little bit more damage with higher level slots but as a whole you will have three level five slots chances are you won't really need to cast this spell more than three times per day anyway at least in my own experience i played i played and saw a lot of characters who use this spell and um my own experience is that you usually don't need more than two of these uh in in any given adventuring day uh mass suggestion obviously why even fight uh the minions like seven million minions there when you can just tell them to leave it's one of the most powerful high level control spells there is uh, there's no reason not to take it so take it uh delayed blast fireball synergizes nicely with uh, time stop if there's nothing else for you to do if uh, mass suggestion for whatever reason doesn't make much sense uh delayed blast fireball will so uh plane shift teleport obviously both of these spells make sense a lot of times the dms will just make up some reason me included that the plane shift doesn't work because once you get plane shift the the campaign becomes plane shift so you're dictating what the campaign is and not something else right um therefore a lot of dms actually kind of make up a lot of reasons why the plane shift spell doesn't work in case the plane shift doesn't work teleport will work and uh, i think it just makes sense for you to have one of these two spells uh, obviously level 8 earthquake come on like you gotta have it right um, and then level 9 time stop as I've already dis uh, described before this is this is your engine for activating all of your all of your buffs trance of order fire shield um, greater invisibility hex hex blade scourge all of that stuff obviously activating it and then after that obviously 
uh, Wish, it's the most powerful 9th level spell in the game, it's the most powerful spell in the game, period. Um, you don't... Uh, the, the, the way I cast Wish is I usually cast lower level spells with it. I don't even... I don't even read this, right? I mean, I don't want to be... I don't wanna... I don't want unintended consequences. So what I do is I duplicate any other spell of 8th level or lower that, in this particular case, the most obvious choice is uh, Simulacrum. If you have enough time, you can cast clones of yourself, become uh, Emperor pa Palpatine. Um, it's like whatever 8th or lower level spell there is in the game, you can cast it with Wish. So basically, again, Simulacrum makes the most, it's the most obvious choice. You double up your Eldritch Blast, you double up all of your things that you can do. And beyond that, obviously, any other spell in the game. So, that's pretty much it for the spells. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that you can do with Wish. I might even make a completely, like, separate video about it. But, uh, for now, this is a little bit of a thing that you can do, right? Uh, items, right? So, I don't... I don't think I... Yeah, I did. So, equipment, I already put uh, some of them. Obviously, the highest armor that you can get. These are all legendary equipments. I know that most of you, all of you, will not be able to get all of this or even most of these things. But this is something that would make sense. Uh, somebody made a comment recently about the blood something? Blood, uh... Blood well while, yeah, 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 yeah. So, Bloodwell Vile would make sense as well. Uh, obviously, plus 3 variety. Now, I think this is... It's a thing that you have to attune to. Yeah, it requires attunement. So, hey, look. Um, maybe you drop the Wand of the War Mage. And... Um, yeah, you drop the Wand of the War Mage. Uh, it does ignore half cover, but it's not really that good. So let's say you drop the Wand of the War Mage and you use Bloodwell Vile, because, I mean, look, you can regain, regain 5 sorcery points and it improves not just your attack rolls, but also the saving throw DCs of your sorcerer spells. This is strictly better in every other way other than improving your... other than ignoring the half cover. So, hey, look, I mean... These are just some of the items that you can take. Obviously, this is not just be all and all, right? Um, so let me end add that blood well while this this drilling is really freaking it's insane, dude. Uh, uh, after I do this video, I'm probably gonna go out of the. Yeah, it's like. My, my brain already hurts. Um, extra sorcery points. And improved sorcerers. Spellcasting DC. What's more to like, right? And it even... Sorry. It even... Um... um yeah, yeah, obviously. So that, that that that's the thing that you do. Um, I'm gonna say that even Bloodwell Vile is a bit better than Wand of the War Mage. So I'm gonna put it over here. Obviously, Rod of the Pack Keeper and Robe of the Arch Magi. Honestly, like this is probably even better than the Robe of the Arch Magi. Robe of the Arch Magi works on um, all of your things and improves your spells, save DC, and attack bonus. So it's like. It works across everything, but this is for Sorcerer, this is for Warlock, so, yeah. Uh, Bloodwell Vile will not improve your Eldritch Blast bonus, so that's why Wand of the War Mage will be, you know, Wand of the War Mage stacks with Rod of the Pact Keeper, but Bloodwell Vile doesn't, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Yeah, Sorcerer spell. So Eldritch Blast is not a Sorcerer spell, it's a... Uh, it's um, it's it's a warlock spell, so it depends, right? It, it's okay. Chances are you're not gonna have Rob of the Archmage. 
chances are this is gonna be right so there we go this is gonna be it's gonna be something like this right so yeah whatever um whatever happens happens those are the items um you can see them i'm gonna link to this character down below you can read them at your own uh uh, in your own time. This video is two hours long. God damn. Uh, progression. I'm gonna edit this uh, this thing over here. I'm, I'm not gonna do it now. To reflect all of the changes in the uh, that, that we discussed previously. Primarily the Clockwork, Meta Mag uh, Clockwork Magic. Where you cannot swap protection from evil and good with the Glyph of Warding. You have to swap Dispel Magic with the Glyph of Warding. In the end, you're, you're, you're gonna have the same spells... But, um, yeah, your spells are gonna be, I don't know, it's gonna be slightly different in terms of, like, when you get them, but um, overall it's gonna be the same. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, if you want, you can go to my, uh, Patreon page, if you would like to download this file, for whatever reason, uh, my Patreon, what is happening? What is happening? There is my Patreon page. Uh... It's, I don't know, like, uh, min-max munchkin something? Yeah, there we go. Uh, pledge into the Magical Secrets tier. It's somewhere in here, I don't even know where exactly, to be honest. Um, it's not mandatory, it's 100% optional. I talk about everything that you get via my patreon page you get in these videos yes they last for two hours but you get that info for free if you can't be bored listening for uh, for me for two hours listening to me for two hours oh my god my voice is going out <coughs> pledge into the magical secrets tier like share comment subscribe hit the bell button you know the youtube drill min max munchkin got and uh talk to you soon